Michael looked at Jennifer with empty, slightly angry eyes. I'm leaving, the man said a few minutes ago. I've met another woman. I'm sorry, but as you know, the heart wants what it wants. What is there to apologise for? Is she your... Jennifer paused, struggling to find the right word. Student? Yes, she is my student. Michael hastily packed a big stack of shirts ironed by his wife into a suitcase and then left for his new, happy life. Fortunately, their only daughter Hannah was at university at this time, but what would happen when she learned that her father, a professor and department head, had abandoned their family for a student who could easily be Hannah's classmate? Jennifer went to the window and gazed out onto the street. Five years ago, she was filled with joy, and when she and Michael bought this flat on the 20th floor, the feeling of soaring high above always thrilled her. But now it felt as if the weight of the sky pressed down on her so heavily that she could hardly breathe. Jennifer was 45 years old. This is the magical age when a woman can live and enjoy life without much stress or responsibility. Her daughter was already grown, studying at the local university, and even in a serious relationship. Jennifer worked as a manager for a company and had a stable salary. Her husband taught at the same institution where their daughter studied. He was highly regarded by his superiors, and he was working on a doctoral thesis. And now, this. Jennifer sank heavily into the chair. She had several friends, but she considered Rita to be her closest and dearest. They had attended school together, studied at the same college, and raised their children synchronously, helping each other with advice. Rita had been a widow for ten years and had tried to find a favourable match, but each time she failed. The men she encountered were haunted by their pasts, greedy, snored excessively, or refused to accept Rita's son. The reasons seemed endless, causing her to reject one man after another. Rita didn't need any explanation to know that her friend was in trouble. She arrived at Jennifer's place almost immediately. As soon as she entered the hallway, she exclaimed loudly, "'What are you doing? Jennifer, are you crying over that worthless man?' "'Yes, I am,' Jennifer answered grimly, anticipating where her and Rita's evening was headed. "'And you're going to help me do it.' "'To cry over this jerk,' Rita expressed her disdain and dragged an impulsively sized bag into the kitchen. "'Does Hannah know yet?' Rita asked and took out two glasses from the cupboard. I don't think so, otherwise she would have called, answered Jennifer indifferently. Meanwhile, a saucer with sliced sausage of Jennifer's favourite kind appeared on the table. A little later, a dessert plate with appetisingly arranged slices of cheese of two different kinds was added to it. A few minutes later, another plate with chocolate broken into cubes was placed nearby. Only then did Rita calm down and sit down next to Jennifer. The woman took out a corkscrew, uncorked the bottle of wine, and quickly filled the wine glasses standing on the table. To you, strong, stylish, successful. She exhaled the first toast. Over a bottle of wine, all Jennifer's innermost thoughts, which she was usually afraid to voice even to herself, found an outlet in concrete words. Two hours later, Hannah came back from university and Jennifer, unable to hide her pain, told her everything. However, for the girl, it was not unexpected news. Hannah had felt the tension between her parents for quite some time. Her mother's explanation was short and very sad, but what the girl remembered most of all was not what her mother said but what she did. Jennifer just sat staring at the table in front of her and crumpled the yellow tissue with her hands and that gesture caused Hannah to cry in her room for two hours. It was not her father's leaving, not his betrayal, but the yellow tissue in her mother's trembling hands that she remembered. And then life began to get better, because Rita took it upon herself to normalise Jennifer's state of mind. Jennifer, you just don't look like yourself. This is a bad way. Dress up and let's go out with you and I don't want to hear that you don't want to go out. Don't make it up. 
everyone wants to go out. We are going to a nightclub, or a walk in the park, or to a nice restaurant. For whom? For yourself. Rita was not embarrassed by anything. She was completely indifferent to Jennifer's mood today, and why she didn't want to go out again. She would just come and almost force Jennifer to dress up, then drag her out of the apartment. A couple of times, Hannah was also invited to join them, but she invariably refused. She didn't want to watch Rita try to entertain her sad, grieving mother. No, she had enough of this spectacle at home. Though the girl, of course, sympathized with her mother from the bottom of her heart, she just didn't know how to help her. Meanwhile, Michael felt himself very well and satisfied. For many years, he lived in marriage with Jennifer and always considered himself quite happy. Even when their young family suffered from a lack of money, after all, his salary was not always as impressive as it is now. But now everything was in the past: the first love, happy family, and the maturation of their only daughter. And now Michael wanted something new, fresh and unexplored. He wanted a new young woman who would be everything to him, the center of his world. And he found such a woman among his students. Even as a young teacher, Michael had often heard the popular saying that all wives grow old, but first-year students never do. But it was only now, when he was in his fifth decade, that he realized the truth of that statement. Indeed, his wife had aged. Jennifer no longer had that youthful excitement that had once enticed him, and that he had fallen for. Now she was a staid old woman for him. Despite being four years younger than her husband, and he knew her inside out, she could no longer surprise him. He wanted something entirely new. Of course, it was the most common midlife crisis. Michael stubbornly refused to age and become a man who obediently followed the circumstances. And when the freshman Camilla caught his attention and made it clear that she was truly interested in him, Michael literally got crazy. He entertained and amused the students, creating ridiculous tasks to ensure he would be remembered by her, and it worked. He and Camilla became lovers. Of course, Michael wasn't rushing to reveal this secret to his wife. He needed to tread carefully before making a final decision. But Camilla repeatedly raised the question of wanting to be with her beloved man. She was tired of hiding and believed she had every right to happiness. She wanted to create a real family. Not continue with this situation where her lover hurriedly left her bed to return to his wife. After three months of secret meetings, Camilla put the question: Either the affair of the head of the department and a young student comes to a quick and inglorious end, or he tells everything to his wife and goes to her. Camilla had no doubts about Michael's choice for a minute. She had already made room for his things in her small rented flat. At first, Michael and Camilla. Were incredibly happy. However, this feeling was more applicable to Michael than to his mistress. He was now glad for the novelty and freshness that now existed in his personal life. But soon, Camilla revealed their relationship to the girls in her class, and the fact that Michael's daughter was studying in the parallel group added more drama to the situation. Hannah was ashamed of her father's actions and refused. To exchange a single word with Camilla, summer was arriving. A busy time for students. Hannah had been preparing for her exams for a couple of weeks, studying notes, writing reports, and preparing essays. However, there was one subject she refused to touch, the one her father taught. Well, how could he do that to Mum? What did she do to deserve it? What did he see in that Camilla? The girl sighed in despair and set the notebook aside. The exam for her father's subject was first, but Hannah lacked the motivation to open the textbook and study. Let him give me any grades he wants. I don't care. Hannah thought with a hint of satisfaction. Just then, her phone screen flashed. It was a message from her boyfriend. Preston was three years older than Hannah, and was about to finish his fourth year. He had big plans for his life. And Hannah was a big part of them. They had been together for nine months, and they were sincerely in love with each other. Preston 
offered to meet Hannah in the evening and go for a walk, and Hannah eagerly texted him, Great! added a kissing smiley face to her message and sent it to Preston. As for Jennifer, it seemed as if she had forgotten how to enjoy the simple things in life, even though she knew it was necessary. Her entire life revolved around Michael and his needs, despite having a job and hobbies. Without Michael, there was no one left for her to take care of. This realization saddened Jennifer the most, because her daughter didn't require her constant care any more. So, who could she give her love and attention to? Rita, her faithful and ever-present friend, kept rescuing her by countless activities. They embroidered beads with a group of eccentric women, went swimming in a pool with soothing music, worked out intensively in the gym to lose some weight, and even visited a fashionable spa recommended by Rita. Overall, they had fun and diverse experiences, but Jennifer felt completely unnecessary and irrelevant. However, this time, Rita had something different in mind. She insisted on visiting a nightclub. Come on, Rita, what does a nightclub have to do with me? Jennifer protested. What's wrong with nightclubs? We can pick someone up there, Rita suggested calmly, resembling the rock in her composure. And honey, just keep in mind that you shouldn't dress like you're going to a funeral. Jeans? Of course not. You won't be attractive in that. Rita walked confidently to the wardrobe and swung the door open in one swift motion. So, what do we have here? Well, to tell you the truth, not much. It feels like I've been friends with a real grey mouse my whole life. Not a pretty, lively woman. Knee-length skirts? No thanks. A shirt with a high collar? Save it for visiting your mum. Jennifer, we're going to a nightclub. It's a place of joy, freedom and debauchery. So, here you go. With these words, Rita pulled out tight trousers and a blouse with a revealing neckline from the depths of the wardrobe. In this, Jennifer could only utter it, looking at the offered items with a hint of criticism in her eyes. Yes, in this, Rita cheekily exclaimed and went to the kitchen to fill their glasses. Jennifer shook her head, but she obediently started changing her clothes. Perhaps Rita was right, and it was time for her to stop living such a sad life. She needed to move forward towards joy. It was too early to give up because, even at forty-five, a happy new life could begin. "'You have to love yourself,' Rita admonished, returning to the room. "'Oh, you look good, by the way. I'd even say you look fabulous. So, surely this evening won't go to waste for you?' Jennifer didn't say anything, but silently nodded. She herself hoped that this evening wouldn't be in vain. Hannah had her own life and Jennifer needed to arrange her own before it was too late. The nightclub was noisy, crowded and smoky. The two women struggled to make their way across the dance floor to a free table near the stage. Rita moved with confidence, while Jennifer tried her best not to bump into anyone or make others uncomfortable. They sat down at the table and began tasting drinks from their small speciality glasses. Shots are really good here, Rita commented. What's the matter, Jennifer? You look like you're dead. Drink it and relax at least a little. Jennifer timidly brought the glass to her lips and smiled. It was truly time to try something she had denied herself for so long, as a decent mother and a good wife. Within half an hour, Rita was already dancing on the dance floor, while Jennifer was still mustering the courage for such a step. She hadn't danced like this in a long time. Or maybe she had never danced like this at all. She watched her friend dance in the midst of Hannah's peers, and a sharp sense of the impropriety burned her from inside. However, driven by an inexplicable impulse that she wouldn't be able to explain later, Jennifer stood up, shook her hair loose, and made her way to where Rita was already having so much fun. Jennifer decided to abandon her habit of thinking, analysing, and comparing for at least this evening. The music blared and crashed into Jennifer's ears like a suffocating wave. Difficult to swim out of, 
Nevertheless, she quickly acclimated to the rhythm, and she suddenly moved to the beat of the music with ease, grace, and freedom. Throughout her conscious life, Jennifer had always considered this kind of pastime beneath her, but now the dance floor of this second-rate club has become the perfect place for her to release all the pent-up pain that had accumulated in her soul, to let it go, and to move to a new level. Beside her, amidst the flashing spotlights and strobe lights, Jennifer saw different people. A young girl, no older than Hannah, looked at her with judgment in her eyes. It was clear that she considered such behaviour from an adult woman too frivolous and definitely disapproved of it. Live your life and be wise and patient with people, Jennifer thought, and maybe one day you'll realise that true freedom has no age limit. At forty-five, you have the right to dance, just as hard as at twenty. Suddenly, right next to Jennifer, a young man in his early twenties appeared from somewhere. Arrogant, well-dressed and harmoniously built, the dream of any girl his age. However, for some reason, he decided to show interest not in girls of the same age, who were abundant here, but in Jennifer. Such attention didn't flatter her. Instead, it vividly reminded her of Michael's actions, who had left her for a young student. The age difference between Jennifer and this young man was the same. How could she not be disgusted? The woman decided not to pay attention to him, hoping that he would likely leave her alone. But that wasn't the case. Despite Jennifer's efforts to demonstrate her lack of interest, the young man didn't retreat. On the contrary, he took her hand. Jennifer didn't like it and tried to pull her hand away, but the young man didn't give her the opportunity. He looked at her with an impenetrable, glassy gaze that made Jennifer feel uncomfortable. In despair, realising she couldn't free herself from this unwanted suitor, she tried once more to pull her hand away, but with the same disappointing result. Jennifer looked around for Rita, who knew exactly what to do with such suitors. But Rita was hidden by the backs of other dancers in the club. Suddenly Jennifer felt the guy trying to lead her off the dance floor. She knocked the guy's hand away, but he took her hand again, this time just above the wrist. Jennifer screamed, but her scream dissolved in the rumble of music. The woman became really scared. If someone had told her a few hours ago that it was possible to forcibly move a woman away from a crowded place, she wouldn't have believed it. But now it was a shocking reality for her. Jennifer tried to resist, but she hadn't expected such persistence from an unknown young man. She struggled as hard as she could, but there was nothing she could do. Jennifer was already on the very edge of the dance hall, and very soon, just in a minute, she could very well find herself in a dark alley by the emergency exit. Just when Jennifer started to panic and realised that things were taking a turn for the worse, the guy's grip suddenly weakened. The woman looked up, filled with relief, and saw a tall, muscular man who had the insolent guy by the throat, like a disobedient puppy. Then Jennifer's saviour effortlessly threw the guy away, as if he were throwing a bothersome toy, and turned to Jennifer. "'Thank you,' Jennifer said, smiling at the man. "'You're welcome,' the stranger replied. "'And let's introduce ourselves, shall we? My name is Luke.' "'My name is Jennifer. Nice to meet you, Luke,' the woman replied. Luke looked to be about fifty years old. He had a clean-shaven face, intelligent grey eyes, and a high forehead. His strong muscles were visible under his light denim jacket, and there wasn't an ounce of extra fat on his body. He really stood out from the regular people in such a place. Jennifer belatedly realised that her appearance today, thanks to Rita's efforts, described her as a regular, frivolous visitor to such places. Luke noticed that Jennifer was looking at him and decided to lighten the mood. So, how do you find my appearance? After such a thorough visual inspection, do you like it? Jennifer was still in shock. After all, it's not every day that a young man tries to drag you into a dark story. So, she answered honestly, without hiding or exaggerating anything. Yes, I do. Thank you again so much. I don't know what I would be doing now without your help. 
Oh, it was nothing. Luke grinned slyly. Besides, you don't seem like the kind of person who frequents these kinds of places. You're absolutely right. Jennifer smiled contentedly. Actually, it's my first time here. I came with a friend. For the first time? Are you serious? Luke asked. Rita, my best friend, brought me here to try it out. She's familiar with this place. Maybe she needs help too, Luke suggested. I don't think so. Jennifer laughed. She feels right at home here, and she's definitely not someone who can get into such situations. Well, that's a relief, Luke muttered. But it's better to find your friend and make sure she is all right. Jennifer nodded slowly, and they made their way through the dancing crowd to the exit. Rita was on the dance floor, surrounded by several admirers. She was cheerful and happy, and Jennifer realized that Rita didn't need her company for the rest of the night. So she said goodbye to her and went through the dancing crowd towards the exit. Luke followed her. He got a cab, and while they were driving, he told Jennifer a little about himself. It turned out that he had divorced many years ago, had a grown-up, independent son student, headed his own company, and in general had settled down quite well in life. He ended up at the nightclub purely by chance, and he had a crazy idea to relive the old days. Jennifer briefly shared some details about herself. She mentioned that she was raising a daughter who was already in university, and one more time she expressed her gratitude to Luke for reacting in time to the situation. They got out of the cab near Jennifer's house, and the man looked around the yard and parked cars with an observant eye. "Where are your windows?" he asked suddenly. "Over there," Jennifer said, pointing with her hand to her own windows. Luke smiled and said, "It's Friday, and tomorrow's a day off, and you're home, right? So, at twelve o'clock, you'll see me in this very spot from your windows. If you want to take a walk with me, or visit a place of your choice, come on down. Okay. Okay." Jennifer nodded, thinking that no one had ever asked her out so elegantly before. Apparently, a shadow. Ran across the woman's face, and her interlocutor noticed it perfectly. "Don't worry," he said clearly and calmly. "Everything will be all right. I promise you. We'll go somewhere and just talk, okay?" "Okay," Jennifer nodded guiltily and belatedly realized that she might have offended him with her sad face. It was time to start thinking about how she looked. Lying in bed. Jennifer recalled every moment with Luke. His gallantry was on top level, and he seemed to be taking her quite seriously. Soothed and lulled by such thoughts, Jennifer was able to sleep peacefully and without dreams. The next day, after a few words with her daughter, Jennifer began preparing for what she believed would be a triumphant date. She carefully chose a charming knitted dress, jewelry, and a clutch. She borrowed a nude lip gloss from Hannah. In short, her entire look was meticulously planned. She was tempted to call Rita, but it was clear that she was still asleep. It was unlikely that her friend's evening at the club ended as quickly as hers. Jennifer wondered all morning whether Luke would come as promised, or if he would suddenly change his plans, especially since he hadn't taken her phone number. She saw her daughter looking at her with obvious interest, but did not rush to discuss yesterday's incident with her. Perhaps this man would never appear in her life again. But he did come, exactly at noon. Luke stood at the agreed place as promised and held a bunch of bright scarlet roses in his hands. He looked as if he had stepped off the cover of some very fashionable magazine. Yes, this meeting. Promised to be a good adventure, Jennifer exited the building with a cheerful and positive attitude, with a determination to conquer the world written on her face, and they set out to conquer it on foot. And why not? When the weather was beautiful, the sky was cloudless, and a flute sang softly in her soul. That walk lasted a long time, almost the whole day. They had time to eat twice at good restaurants. Ride the riverboat, and even the Ferris wheel in the local amusement park. 
Jennifer had never felt so comfortable with someone, never felt so light and eager to live. All her problems seemed to fade into the background, and she became a smooth, cheerful woman, before whom a world full of possibilities was opening up. A wonderful feeling of light and warmth overwhelmed her soul, pushing away the dark waves of pain and despair. Luke was also glad to meet a real lady at a nightclub. To him, Jennifer was polite, refined, yet gentle and kind, and she was stunningly beautiful as well. In short, both of them realised that this encounter would be more than just a casual acquaintance, with no obligations for either of them. They spent Sunday together, just as much fun as Saturday. However, in the evening, a light rain started to fall over the city. Jennifer and Luke managed to find shelter in a cosy home cafe, known for its home-cooked meals. There, surrounded by live music and flickering candles, their conversation became heartfelt and fascinating. Jennifer listened to her new acquaintance, her mouth hanging open in surprise. As it turned out, Luke had visited various continents, swam in the Mariana Trench and climbed impressive peaks. He had gone diving and ice fishing at different times. He had started building a log cabin in the mountain district and dreamed of exploring outer space. Unfortunately, Jennifer had nothing special to share. She realised that her life as a teacher's wife was quite dull and monotonous. Each day, month and year seemed like a carbon copy of the previous one. She raised her daughter, took her family to the local sea once a year, and occasionally travelled to nearby foreign countries. That was it. No exciting hobbies or captivating moments in her biography. Luke, however, didn't consider his achievements outstanding. He believed he led an ordinary life, and all his accomplishments were the result of hard work. Still, he was flattered that someone like Jennifer saw him as purposeful and experienced. The following week was incredibly beautiful and unforgettable for Jennifer. Luke invited her to his mountain house, a place he had built with his own hands from logs. Of course, Jennifer couldn't refuse his invitation. After work, they met near her house, hopped into the car, and headed to the district village. Surrounded by tall pines and fragrant wild flowers, Jennifer felt alive and truly happy for the first time since Michael's betrayal. One late summer evening, Hannah came home feeling a bit thoughtful and immediately sought her mother's advice. Jennifer was busy at the computer, browsing for a nice outfit for their next trip out of town from an online store. But the look on her daughter's face indicated that something out of the ordinary had happened. She motioned for Hannah to sit down and looked at her attentively. Well, dear, spill it. What's happened? Is it good or bad? Don't just keep it to yourself, Jennifer said. I think it's good, Hannah whispered almost inaudibly. Preston asked me to marry him. Oh, dear, that's good news. My little Hannah has grown up and is going to be a bride. Jennifer's joy seemed boundless. That's more than good. It's wonderful, she said with genuine excitement. Where are you going to live? Does Preston have a part-time job? You said he's a student. You know that married life is no joke, right? You've bombarded me with questions. The girl pretended to frown. He understands everything, Mum, don't worry. Preston works part-time at his father's company, and his father has provided him with a place to live. It's a small one-bedroom apartment, but it's his own, so that's not a problem. Then what is it? Jennifer's bewilderment reached its peak. If you truly love each other and housing and income are settled, then I don't see any problems. You see, Mum, I'm afraid. Hannah exhaled her most frightening confession. I am afraid that in time it will turn out that my Preston will do to me what Dad has done to you. That I will be disappointed in him and I won't be able to trust anyone else. You know, they're all so loving and decent at first and then you know what happens afterward. Jennifer sat silently for a while and only the clock on the wall ticked off the seconds of silence that pressed on both women in the room. Finally, Jennifer looked at Hannah and said as affectionately as she could, Darling, the way your dad acted is not common for all the men, and we can't predict everything. So 
Just live at the moment and be happy. The important thing is that you have me and I have you, and we will always support each other. Don't transfer your father's bad deed to all men. I'm sure Preston will be a real support for your whole life. And you know what? You and Preston are here for dinner tonight. I'll get Luke as well, and later I'll ask him if he thinks Preston is reliable. Good thinking, Mum. Hannah laughed. A kind of stress test. Great, and yes, I have one more favour to ask of you. I don't even know how to say it. Anyway. Don't say a word to Dad about me getting married, okay? I just don't want to see him at my wedding and hear his fake congratulations, please, Mum. Okay, honey. Jennifer promised. She wasn't sure if her daughter was doing the right thing now, but it was her choice, and she was within her right to follow her heart. After all, Hannah was an adult, and it was up to her to make such decisions. Hannah left her mother's room with a light heart. In the evening, Preston arrived on time. Dressed up and perfumed, with two bouquets of flowers for Hannah and Jennifer, the hostess seated the guest in an armchair and said that Luke might be a little late due to his work. Preston engaged in polite conversation with Jennifer and seemed quite sincere in his answers. Jennifer asked the usual questions in such situations about his childhood, parents, studies, and his career plans. Preston answered thoroughly and with humour. Staying within the boundaries of polite communication with his bride's mother, Jennifer liked it, as she believed this was how a future son-in-law should behave. Suddenly, the doorbell rang. Jennifer opened the door, and Luke came in, holding two bouquets. The woman was so happy to see her beloved that she didn't notice Preston's face change. The young man literally jumped up from the chair in which he had been sitting calmly a minute ago. And jumped out into the hallway. Oh, Dad! What a turn of events! I think I finally realised why you've been so happy and dreamy lately. Preston said with a smile and hugged his father. The evening went wonderfully, and Jennifer was relieved for her daughter, because she knew that a father as decent as Luke could not raise a bad son. Meanwhile, Michael. Wasn't as happy as he was at the beginning of his affair with Camilla. Now the man realised that he was able to truly experience calmness and happiness only near Jennifer. But alas, the choice was not made in her favour, and that decision was wrong. First, an unexpected and serious blow to the man was that his only daughter simply interrupted communication with him, as if there were no years when he fed. Taught and took care of her. To his great surprise, Hannah simply stopped responding to him, and greeted him at the university and even in his lessons. She preferred to communicate strictly officially. Secondly, Camilla turned out to be entirely different from what Michael expected. He wanted to have an understanding and patient woman next to him, but it turned out that the understanding woman was actually Jennifer, while Camilla did not even pretend to understand anything. She constantly begged for good grades for herself and her girlfriends, and for money. And worst of all, the flow of demands did not stop for a second. In addition, once Michael accidentally heard a conversation not intended for his ears. In it, Camilla called him quite derogatory, if not outright humiliating. No one would have liked such a form of address to themselves, especially from their favourite girl. Jennifer had never allowed herself to address him that way, and the issue was not at all that the two women had a significant age difference, but that Jennifer simply could not insult a person with such attitudes and such treatment. She couldn't, and that was it. And recently, Michael had fallen ill. Suddenly, out of the blue, he had a high blood pressure. He complained to Camilla, lying next to him, but received in reply a calm look. If you get worse, she said calmly, you can call an ambulance. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get ready. We are going to the party tonight, so I take it you're not going, right? Yes, I'm not going. Michael barely managed to whisper out. Yeah, he hadn't expected such treatment from her. Jennifer would never do that to him. On the contrary, 
she always tried to help cure everyone around her, and only then did she think of herself. And now, because of all these unpleasant insights, he often thought about Jennifer and couldn't sleep. The loss of communication with his daughter, health problems, and the lack of basic courtesy from the person for whom he had sacrificed everything. All this brought Michael to a state of deep despair. He saw this phase of his life in an entirely different way. He had dreamt of being rejuvenated alongside the cheerful and lively Camilla, but instead he had become a boring old man who was constantly reminded of his age. With each minute spent with Camilla, he yearned more and more to return to his previous life, to the place where he was valued and truly belonged. The university began to take up more and more of his time. However, Michael knew that he would never be able to write a doctoral thesis. Something inside him had burned out, and his own betrayal of his own family had paved the way for these very unfortunate circumstances. Michael could physically feel himself aging with each passing day. Camilla began to leave the house more frequently in the evenings to spend time with her friend, often staying out until the morning. Michael knew very well what these goings out meant. He had even done something similar himself when he needed to escape from his family to be with Camilla. No, he was not foolish, and understood everything perfectly well, just as Camilla understood that Michael understood everything clearly. However, she didn't care, because she had already satisfied her ego. She didn't need anything more from him, except for money and good grades, of course. As for money, Michael left the spacious apartment to his wife and daughter, but not out of love for them. The reason was that otherwise Jennifer would demand her share of the funds stored in the accounts, and those funds had already been earmarked by Michael for a new happy life with Camilla. So they decided to be fair. Jennifer received the house as her personal property, and he kept the deposits. On one hand, everything seemed fair, but on the other hand, Michael realised that he had miscalculated. Camilla had long insisted that he buy her something significant and worthwhile, something she could take as real evidence of his love. For a long time, he had no idea what she was talking about, and then six months later, he discovered that she had been speaking about an apartment for her. This news nearly made Michael sick. He tried to argue with Camilla, explaining that he had already rented a good apartment for them, but she pursed her lips and left the house. Therefore, the hapless hero lover had to urgently find a place that would be enough to prove his serious intentions and real love, and to buy it in Camilla's name, of course. She insisted on this option, justifying it by saying that otherwise she wouldn't be able to feel like the mistress of the new flat. Needless to say that all the negative changes in Camilla's behaviour occurred right after she became the proud owner of her own personal space. But sadly for Michael, the realisation of his own stupidity was too late. Now, the boring man was no longer needed for Camilla, and she lived with him while he was helping her with whatever she asked, especially at university. Their common future seemed utterly hopeless, and Michael didn't need to be an expert to see that. After weighing the pros and cons, Michael decided to reconcile with Jennifer. In his opinion, she should forget everything and forgive him, at least for the sake of their daughter, who probably missed her father deep in her heart. Unfortunately for the man, he had never been so far from the truth. Preparations for the wedding were in full swing. A wonderful wedding dress had already been chosen, light, flowing and snow-white, Jennifer, Rita and Hannah spent a long time picking out shoes and gloves that would complement the beauty of the dress and make it unique. All three had no doubt that Hannah would be the most beautiful bride in the world. The women chose a restaurant with mind-blowing cuisine and good service, along with a toastmaster, musicians, photographer and videographer. So Jennifer was fully occupied with preparing for her daughter's wedding. But soon she was going to face one meeting. Meetings in life can vary, some unpleasant, some long-awaited, and some unnecessary. 
Jennifer's encounter with Michael fell into the third category. It happened on a day when Luke couldn't pick her up from work, and she returned home alone. Hi, Michael greeted her, getting out of his parked car and holding a bouquet of flowers. What are these unexpected flowers for? Oh, it's definitely for a reason, Jennifer thought. She had the strong urge to hide at the entrance, but she dismissed the thought, considering it humiliating. Especially since now, Michael looked different now, like a wounded dog returning to its kennel out of habit, hoping for a bowl of scraps. It was pathetic to witness how far he had fallen. What do you want? She asked, trying to sound neutral. I want to talk, Michael replied, surprised and even offended. I, I want to come back. You have to understand, Jennifer. I didn't realize what I was doing. I was deceived. This woman, Camilla, she's a nightmare. I don't know how I could have done something so terrible to you. What can I do to make it up to you? Please tell me. I'll do anything. I'll never leave you again, and I'll always be by your side. Perhaps if Jennifer had heard these words earlier, when she was engulfed in grief, she might have believed her husband's lies. But not now, when she had emerged from the depths of depression and had no intention of returning. Jennifer shook her head, indicating her refusal. Jennifer! Michael howled indignantly. You can't do this to me. Camilla robbed me, leaving me with nothing. You can't deny me that we bought our apartment together. You have to let me in. We have a daughter together. Come to your senses, Jennifer. Ah, now you finally remember that you have a daughter. Jennifer raised her eyes at Michael, causing him to almost recoil. Where were you when everyone was pointing fingers at Hannah because of what her father did? Where were you when she and I resolved our problems on our own? So please, stop coming to me and trying to talk to me. You've taken your share. Don't bother me any more. Your homelessness is your problem. You're a smart man, Michael. You should have known what was happening, shouldn't you? And now, sorry, I'm in a hurry. With a straight and confident stride, Jennifer passed by Michael, leaving him truly frightened. All this time, he held the belief deep within his consciousness that she would shelter him in case of an emergency. That was the only reason he had recklessly thrown himself into this whirlwind. Jennifer was his backup plan, his insurance against any misfortunes. And now she was behaving like this. Wait, Jennifer! He shouted after her one more time. I've heard that Hannah's getting married. I don't know the details. Then keep on not knowing, came the reply from Jennifer. Michael was left alone in the courtyard of the apartment building, watching as the door of the entranceway closed behind Jennifer. Yeah, his craving for pleasure had come at too high a price. As soon as the newlyweds come out, throw the petals right away, the videographer said to all guests and set up a working camera on a tripod. Jennifer looked back at Luke, standing next to her. He pressed her hand imperceptibly but firmly, and the woman couldn't resist leaning on his strong shoulder for a second. Finally, the newlyweds walked between the two rows of relatives, acquaintances and friends. Scarlet and white petals flew into the air, and Jennifer watched her daughter and wished that she would be lucky in her marriage. Suddenly, she sensed that Luke was no longer beside her. No sooner had the woman begun to look for him than she suddenly heard his sonorous and rich baritone. "'May I have your attention, please?' he asked, and everyone present turned their heads toward him. "'So, we have just witnessed the birth of a new family,' and new plans, hopes, and dreams. However, the surprises are not over for today, and I am firmly convinced that no one is waiting for such a surprise. Many times I wanted to do exactly this, but something always got in the way. Now no one will stop me. Luke took a small velvet box out of his pocket and opened it with a click. Inside on a cushion lay a ravishingly beautiful gold diamond ring. It shimmered and drew the eyes of those around her. However, probably most of them could not understand what this box was opened today in honour of. 
and only Jennifer had a strange feeling in her soul, like when she was waiting for Santa Claus as a child. Luke, meanwhile, came up to her, carefully got down on one knee, and said softly but clearly, I ask my beloved Jennifer to become my wife. While Jennifer stood as if struck by thunder and looked at this picture, someone began to applaud. Then someone else followed suit, and another, and another. Soon everyone was clapping their hands. Yes, she said with tears in her eyes, and it was the nicest music to Luke's ears and his heart.